Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets what? Deep into the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm Scott Goldfein, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guide of Funk. You want to have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. What are you waiting for? Whether you're watching or listening, as always, I thank you very much for your continued interest and support. On this episode, we're featuring Fred Alexander Jr., the barefoot drummer and composer who has kept the beat right on time for four decades with one of the mightiest funk and R&B bands of the late 70s and 1980s, Lakeside. With roots in what became the funk hotbed of Dayton, Ohio, the group's beginnings trace back to 1969 as Stephen Shockley, the group founder. That's when the Nomads and Monterey's joined forces to become the Young Underground, which then became the Ohio Lakeside Express in 1971 and eventually Lakeside. After false starts with Kurdom and Motown Records, the group which had attracted Dick Griffey as an advisor and a manager of sorts, released its self-titled album on ABC Dunhill in 1976. They failed to draw much attention, but in 1977, Alexander joined Lakeside just as the group was about to hit its stride. Coincidence? Maybe, but the funk all starts with the drummer, and he clearly had a good feel for it. After being pursued by Norman Whitfield, uh, Norman Whitfield's label, Lonnie Simmons' Total Experience label, and Solar Records, the band opted to choose the latter as a recording home, largely due to their strong relationship with owner Dick Griffey, who agreed to let Lakeside write and co-produce their own material, something Norman Whitfield, a bit of a control freak with uh, Undisputed Truth and, and Starguard and Rolls Royce and all those acts, would not do. Released in 1978, the Shot of Love album included the 1979 funk smash, It's All the Way Live. It began a run of six successful albums and a gang of dance hits, jams, and ballads. Those albums were Rough Riders in 1979, Fantastic Voyage in 1980, Keep On Moving Straight Ahead and Your Wishes My Command in 1981, Untouchables in 1983, and Outrageous in 1984. A pair of subsequent albums, Power in 87 and Party Patrol in 1990, represented the group in its decline. All total, though, Lakeside scored three top 10 R&B albums, with four others reaching number 35 or higher, and had 13 top 40 songs. Very impressive. Notable tracks from the Lakeside catalog include Pull My Strings from Nine and Toll, the number one sensation that later also became a chart topper for rapper Coolio, Fantastic Voyage, Your Love is on the One, the Slow Down Beatles remake, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Something About That Woman, Raid, Turn the Music Up, The Ballad, Real Love, Outrageous, and several others. No question, some of those are the baddest funk cuts of the period. Aside from that, Lakeside's sound and style was unique. They began as a singing group and a band, and that uncompromising approach to fully represent both sides of that equation helped distinguish the group. With conceptual gatefold covers featuring elaborately illustrated themes of group members dressed as pirates, cowboys, genies, and other fun motifs, Lakeside stood out in record stores similar to the way that covers by acts like Ohio Players and Funkadelic did. Although the group's only release in nearly 30 years was a live album more than 20 years ago, Lakeside has steadily kept the fire alive on stage and continues to maintain a busy concert schedule. In this in-depth interview, Alexander, who also serves as the band's general manager, not only recounts Lakeside's entire history, but gets into the weeds with lots of fascinating stories and details. As forthcoming and down-to-earth as they come, he conveys a great passion for not only the music, but especially connecting with people. With that, it is most definitely time to get all the way live with Mr. Fred Alexander, Jr., I am so pleased to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership, Mr. Fred Alexander, Jr. 
who for more than 40 years has served as a drummer and a composer for the tremendous funk R&B group Lakeside. Fred, <laughs> how's it going today? Oh, it's going good, man. Bless. Woke up this morning, <laughs> you know. <laughs> half the battle, right? That's half the battle right there. Well, I'm so glad that you could join me today. Huge fan going all the way back to, uh, you know, it's all the way live, so. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, you're going back, uh, 1979. Yeah, I, I thought it was 78, but yeah. Well, actually, yeah. it was 78. We did it in 78, and it didn't really get off the ground to 79. But yeah, we recorded it in 78. You're right. Yeah, I had the 12-inch and, and the album. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. Remember the Robin Hood theme and all that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was because... Uh, Shot of Love. We had a song on there called Shot of Love. I mean, as, as corny as it may sound, we were kind of corny anyway, but I guess we was just living out our childhood. And you would pull the arrow, shoot the girl, she's in love, like Cupid, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I think we're all a little more naive back then. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, if it was only that easy, that you had a love arrow that you could shoot. Wouldn't that yeah. be something? <laughs> yeah, you can make a lot of money on that. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Fred, where are you coming to us uh, from today? I'm in Dallas right now. Yeah, I'm in Dallas. Uh, we're based in L.A., uh, but I, I live in, I have a house in Dallas, and plus my mom has dementia, so I'm a caretaker. So I spend most of my time at her house in Dallas and uh, I come in and out right here. I was just getting back, we're just getting back from, uh, we did Houston, a place called the arena mm -hmm. and it's a theater in the round. So the theater moves everywhere. And we just did that and with the SOS band. Uh -huh. And then the next night, it was a kind of grueling trip because Friday in Houston, catch a six o'clock flight the next morning to go to Hampton, Virginia. We don't get to Hampton until three o'clock. Then rush to the venue to do a sound check and hit the stage at 7.30. Wow. Yeah, it was that's us, that's boys the men. <laughs> yeah, us, boys the men, and Frankie Beverly and Mays. Ooh, nice lineup. Yeah, it was a good lineup. Wonderful crowd. They were in there early too. Yeah, uh -huh. it looked like the round stages too. No, that one was just regular stage. It, but the the theater is a, I mean, the stadium is a big round stadium. You can see it from afar. Holds about ten thousand. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Um. So, how long have you been in in Texas? Uh, well, originally I'm originally from Texas. Okay. And uh, I used to have a little band called Liquid Funk. And, you know, we would go on the weekends and come back and go to school. And then once school was out, we kind of headed west. And we played a few clubs with Lake, at that time, they were Ohio Lakeside Express. So we did a bunch of shows together. And then some kind of way we all headed west uh, to LA. And my band, we used to open up at a place called the Total Experience. For a lot of the, the big acts that would come and play at the Total Experience, we was the opening band. And then a lot of my guys got homesick and wanted to come back to Dallas. And I was like, well, you know, if you want to go back to Dallas, go ahead on. I'm here. I'm not leaving. I'm here. I'm, I'm going to be right here in L.A. And it was kind of my first year by myself and L.A. was kind of rough. <laughs> and then my mom came so I could have a cushion, you know, and somewhere to live because I was all over the place. I mean, you know, I would ride the bus up and down La Brea Street. And then I finally got a good gig uh, on the weekends out at Seal Beach mm -hmm. with a guy at this place called Jolly Rogers. And I was making some good money who most of my guys went on back to Dallas. And I went to this party, uh, Raj 
from uh what was it different strokes what, what's happening yeah what's happening that was it what's happening yeah. well he had a party in malibu and i went to the party with me and my two sisters and the guys from lakeside was there so we got to talking and they remember us from doing shows together we did a show when our last shows together was in phoenix at a place called jk lounge and none of the regular people in the city went to this club because it was a club where pimps showed off their women. So that's all it was there. It was like, this was the pimps club. So nobody else came there but pimps. So they would all come and show off their women. We was the entertainment. We go on first and then Lakeside went on. And then once we left there, we all headed west. And like I say, my guys came back home and I stayed. And eventually, once I got a good gig going, I did went to the party like I, I stated. And uh, Steve, the guitar player, and some of the other guys was like, man, why don't you come on down, you know, and, and, and rehearse with us and hang with us because their drummer had left. So I went down and hung out with them for a minute. And I was like, well, man, you know, I'm making some good money on my gig, you know. And so they was like, well, come on, rehearse with us. And I hung out with them and they was like, Hey man, why don't you join the band? And my thing was, okay, I'm gonna give up this great gig I'm doing to almost going to making nothing. But I was never gonna make records on this good gig that I was making six, seven hundred dollars a week on. And I was like, okay, I'll join the band if we're gonna make records. And so they all say, I'll, I'll, I'll starve if we're gonna make records. And they was like, well, that's our whole purpose, man. We're, we, we're going to write and make records. So in order to keep us from starving, we used to run to Canada, Calgary, Edmonton, uh, Vancouver. We always could run up there and work and get a good gig. So we'd run up there and stay maybe three or four weeks, you know, at a time. And then come back to L.A. with a little change in our pocket. So we could keep rehearsing because all we did was rehearse every day. Rehearse, 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 write songs, rehearse. And I mean, they don't do it like that now, but that was the fun way to do it because you was at your rehearsal hall every day. Uh, it was a lot of magic happened just because you were together. You know, you might write a song by yourself and then you get with the guys and you say, hey man, check this out. And then they would say, oh, yeah, that's bad. But once everybody got a hold to it, a lot of the magic happened to the song that you didn't even anticipate. And it only happened just because of the vibe of everybody. Mm -hmm. And the song would turn into something even better than what you intended it to, just because you had all these other ideas come from, from different guys. And that's kind of how we used to do it every day. We would just rehearse something and rehearse something. And then somebody would say, uh, come along and write yeah man that's bad just put that in there and that's kind of how we put put all the songs together so we just rehearsed fred, fred that was around 77 when you first got with him though yeah yeah well kind of like i met him like 76 and we kind of i kind of got with him at the end of 76 and start and just officially got in the band and from that point on like i say we just rehearsed a lot and run back and forth to Canada. So the three main companies that had black artists was Fort Knox, Total Experience, and Solar. Those, those were the three, three main ones. Uh, and, and it's funny because back then, companies would, would, would come and, and uh, you know, try to get you to be with their companies. You didn't have to run after record companies. Like we did a gig at Total Experience. So all the record companies came down, you know, and they was all bidding for you. Hey, man, come over to my company. This is what's happening at my company. Other company would be like, hey, come over to our company. This is, and all of the companies knew the band was bad because we kind of started out at uh, Maverick Flats right there on, on uh, Crenshaw. So most of the bands are up and coming bands always played Maverick Flats. And Maverick Flats is still there today. Yeah. And so after all of those years, it's still there. So we would play out of Maverick Flats 
and Total Experience was down this down the corner, which was a bigger place for shows, you know. And we started playing there. So when they came and bid it on us, we we knew what we wanted to do in terms of being with a record company. So like Fort Knox came, uh, he, they had uh, Rolls Royce. Mm -hmm. But the problem with Rolls Royce was big at the time. And the problem with Fort Knox is that they wanted to write all the records. You know, he had writers, he was a writer. So they wanted to write all the records, you know, and we were like, well, no, we want to write what Lakeside is about. And well, we were just a subsidiary of a bigger label. Uh, Ford Knox. Yeah. I forgot who the bigger label was that they were with. Yeah. But all of them were like that. Yeah. Well, either one would be with Capital or, you know, something like that or, or Universal. I mean, they all had a big conglomerate that they were with. And, you know, like how, how the big boys had five or six smaller companies that were up under their umbrella where they distributed all the records and that kind of, they made the deal with the small company and then the small company had artists and they made the deal with their artists. Right. But the bigger companies like Capital or whatever, they would stand behind the deal and they sort of had to okay it also. So what happened, uh, excuse me. How big was the band? Was it about eight or 10 guys? It was nine of us on stage. And then we had three crew guys at the time. So what happened, Fort Knox came and we didn't like that deal. We're like, nah, we're not gonna do that. If we can't write, we don't wanna be with you. And then uh, Total Experience came and Total Experience had the Gap Band and they had uh, Yarboroughs and Peoples and all those people over there. Uh, and I had told y'all girls and peoples once they came to LA, I said, man, y'all need to come over here to Solar, you know, because I mean, we got Midnight Star, we got the Whispers, you know, we got the deal, you know, we had Dynasty, Shalimar. You know, Shalimar. I mean, we was loaded, you know what I'm saying? So they wanted to go over there because they knew the Gap Band and they was part of that clique. And I never felt like Total Experience did the groups right. You know, in the back room, they were pencil whipping them. And, you know, I said, no, nah, we don't want to be over there. And they didn't want you to write your records either. Lonnie wanted to have something to do with every record. And, and they had their little writers that was writing. So they had to employ their writers. So what they did was employ their writers on the groups. So the groups, hardly ever were able to write any of their own records. Mm -hmm. So we're like, no. So Dick said, look, on your first record, if y'all come over here with me, I will guarantee you at least half your record, half your album you can write. And then I'm going to get Leon to be in Leon Silvers to be in there with you guys to make sure that it's produced well. You guys can co-produce it with Leon. And we know we knew that Leon was real savvy and recording and he had a very good ear and really a talented brother. So we, we said, okay, long as we can write, we'll do it. And so the first album, that's where the first album went. The second album, he basically just said, well, okay, y'all got it, you can write your own album. And we still use Leon, you know, to come in with us, help us produce it, make sure our recording technique was correct and you know, dealing with the boards and sounds and making sure the e engineering was correct because we wanted to get everything out of the band. That, and, was uh, state, Fred, that, that first album was Shot of Love that we talked about. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Lakeside actually had a previous album, I guess, under the Lakeside name on ABC back in 76 before you were there. Well, I had came along right after they had recorded that one. And it's it, it wasn't a bad album, but ABC flopped. So anything that was on the label, you know how that goes. It was a wash. But I remember when I got with the group, we used to play this song called If I Didn't Have You. It's still one of my favorite songs today. And to me, that was the best song on the album to me. Because when we would play that song live, women would go crazy. 
I mean, it was a part of the section that went uh, shabba da da, shabba da, be do be do, shabba da da, shabba da da, shabba da, ooh, shabba da da. I mean, we used to sing that and they just melt. Hell, I would melt myself because I was so in love with the song, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but yeah, that wasn't a bad album. I think Frank. What's Frank, Frank's last name? I can't think of Frank. God, I forgot his last name. But he was the one that, that produced that album with the group. And at that time, Lenny Williams was out. And, and we ended up singing background on Lenny Williams records. Uh, most of that album that, that he had with the, oh, 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 we're singing background. <laughs> A lot of people don't even know that. Yeah, <laughs> we're singing background on Lenny Williams' album. And like, even with Solar, we wrote a lot of the stuff for the other artists, like Climax, uh, me and Stevie, the guitar player, we wrote a song for the Whispers on one of their albums. Uh, and so Dick would use the writers in the groups to help the other groups, and we would write songs for the other groups. And it was more of an in-house family kind of, environment you know what i'm saying it wasn't like total experience and and fort knox they kind of bum rushed everything but over solar he let us be free and he let us have freedom because he recognized the talent that he had and the and, and the songwriting of the group and so we were able to be lakeside we were able to be what we thought we were about and that's all we ever wanted in terms of a record deal fred um so when uh, It's All The Way Live became a top five R&B hit, um, how did the band react? You know, were you guys surprised, expecting it? You know, how did it change you? Man, the first time I heard that record on the radio, I lost my mind. I mean, cause I couldn't believe mm -hmm. I was actually listening to myself on the radio. I mean, people don't understand. That's one hell of a feeling. And I don't care how long you're in the business, it's still a hell of a feeling. <laughs> you know, we were on our way to, where is, what is, it's Howard University, in, it's in Washington, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, we were on our way to Howard University. Where the Blackbirds are from. Yeah, we got a gig at Howard University. It was cold as I don't know what, man. And when we got to, to Washington, D.C., we were riding in the car when I first heard All The Way Live on the radio. And it came on the radio. I just lost it. I mean, even when the record went off, I was still like, couldn't believe I just heard our record on the radio. The way records sound on radio behind another record. That was a hell of a feeling to just know we were in the mix. And we went to Howard and did the concert and stuff we had in the truck in the back. All our stuff got stole out the truck, right? Uh -huh. While we were inside doing the concert. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but most of the stuff that we needed was in the theater with us. So some little stuff like stands and stuff like that. But just the idea that we're inside doing a concert and somebody breaking the truck. So, well, we had most of our stuff. So it was time to leave Howard and go to Huntsville, Alabama. And that was our first real concert. That concert was with the Barcades when they were hot, you uh, know, and he had the snake and they had the big production and the 18 wheelers. And I mean, they right just they had, had everything. Yeah. And, and Larry Dodson just took us under his wing, man, you know, because we got to Huntsville and Peebo Bryson and them had their stuff up. And they didn't want to move none of the equipment so we could have just a little bit of room at the front of the stage to do our show. So we didn't even have no room to do our show. So Larry Dawson came out and said, if this stuff doesn't get moved, we're not performing. Mm -hmm. And man, that promoter, the promoter itself was moving stuff, okay? <laughs> they moved that stuff where we had enough room to do our show. And it was all because of Larry Dawson that that happened. Wow. And we didn't even know him. But he was like, man, these guys are going to get a chance to play. I guess, you know, what it is is that guys like that have been in the same position when they started. 
you know, you're opening an egg, you get treated like crap, you don't get nothing. And all you want to do is just do your show and show who you are. So after we got through with our show, though, people Bryson had a hard time because we brought it. Yeah. And from that point on, we had respect. I mean, we had to go take our respect. And if it wasn't for Larry Dawson making sure we had enough on the room on the stage, we might not even got a chance to play. Wow, that was amazing. He, he was on uh, the show a couple of months ago. Um, and his influence is incredible because also just a couple of weeks ago, I had the lead singer from Chocolate Milk on and Barquets were a huge impact on them too. It just goes to show you some of the groups that were good to other groups, new groups. They didn't treat new groups bad. Then you had the bands that treated new groups bad just because they're a new group. But well, all of us was a new group at one time. Larry himself had said that George Clinton was very helpful to the Barquets. So. Yeah, we've done a lot of dates with George Clinton. I'll sit, the, sit, sit down and talk to George many times. Very nice guy compared to what maybe people think he's weird and all that very intelligent brother knows a lot about recording knows a lot about writing records knows a lot about performing and uh, we've had some wonderful shows with george but the bar case they just it, they really touched me because they were huge i mean they were big i was like man i want to be like that you know they were huge and he still was a humble nice guy and when larry dodson said i'm not gonna perform man people people got to moving you know because they was a headliner and this guy's show was going to be messed up you know they got to moving and from that point on me and larry dodson have been best friends i talk to him just about on a daily basis because we do a lot of things and uh so we talk a lot all the time. And I remember the show we did where he retired. I was like, oh, Larry, you're going to miss it. He said, I know I'm going to miss it. Maybe I still come out and do a couple of shows sometime. You know, it's that kind of thing. But uh, we we talk all the time because Larry still books us. So he'll call me and say, hey, man, what are you doing on this date? I say, well, I'm not doing nothing on that date. He said, well, I got a master's date. You know, I want you guys to be a part of. And I remember when the Masters first started, Larry came to me. He said, well, man, we only need two or three of the guys. I said, no, Larry, that's not going to work. We're lakeside or nothing. We don't do track. It's the whole band or nothing. That's what makes lakeside. Mm -hmm. That's what makes our sound. Not one or two or three of the guys. It's got to be everybody. So Larry called me back and said, okay, man. And we were one of the only bands that could have our whole band because Larry's band played and maybe one or two people of the other bands they played. But we were the only one that was able to, when it came time for our sick band play. So I, I love him for that because he saw that we was a strong part of the Masters of Funk that made it happen. And he did the right thing by having us on the show and letting the whole band perform. So now we're just a part of it. Whenever he calls me for a date, I'm there. Well, it's certainly to the benefit of the fans to get to see the full Lakeside. Yeah. Um, Fred, I want to ask you about, it's all the way live. You know, the groove, of course, was amazing. But it was very interesting the way the song changes up so much in the middle and becomes sort of like a Latin rhythm. And there's mm -hmm. all this instrumentation. And mm -hmm. how did you guys decide to change it up like that much? Well, we we, we played a lot of different stuff. And then uh, our kunga player grew up in East LA. So he had a lot of Latin influence. And he grew up with a lot of Latinos and stuff. And so while we were playing, I mean, this was just a section that was by itself. We were just sitting up playing and, and was playing that groove, you know, and it was nice. So basically what we did was just add it to what we already had. When we got to that section, we just went boom, you know, straight bass drum to set it up. And it and and that straight bass drum only goes for eight bars to get ready to set it up. 
And then I go, boom, boom, You see what I'm saying? It goes over there. But it's still the same tempo as the other thing. And then at the end of it, I do a tom tom roll and all the way live, we back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but oh, all it comes was, back in. It's awesome. Yeah, it's just back in. But it wasn't nothing hard for us. It was just like something really easy. Most of our stuff is very easy, but it sounds like it's hard. <laughs> it seemed like it's hard. And a lot of guys don't play the stuff right because they, they think in too hard. They think it's really that hard. It's not really that hard. But and we made it real simple. And then Stevie comes in with the guitar solo and you know, uh it's really a real simple part. But I just always put that was a beat that I like to play all the time too. So I just always played that beat and it gave it that vibe. Now, now you play uh famously play barefoot, right? So how did how did yeah. you develop your drumming style and how did you come to you know, be like some of those uh, barefoot kickers in the NFL. <laughs> well, what happened is, uh, you know, I used to just listen to everybody. It was a lot of drummers, Buddy Rich, and, you know, just a lot of drummers that I liked. Uh, Art Blakey. And I mean, I just used to listen to all these cats because I really was a jazzer. My father was a jazz musician. So basically, I was a jazzer. I wasn't really a funker yet. And then after I started listening to a lot of different uh, drummers that I really liked, um, I just started practicing. And what happened, I used to play with shoes. But then when I started practicing barefooted, the drums felt totally different than, where, than the way they felt when I played with shoes. Because it was like, it wasn't something in between my foot and the pedal. So once my foot, would, it went, once it became just me and the pedal, I could, I had more control. And it felt better, it just felt natural. And the drums just felt totally different. It's like I had a better relationship with the drums for playing barefooted. So I started, I kind of messed myself up in, in rehearsing like that all the time until I got where I had to play like that, you know? I was stuck because I love the way the drums feel. And my style, just came from listening to a lot of drummers, different style, Latin drummers, funk drummers, jazz drummers. I listened to a lot of different drummers, you know. I kind of like everybody. You know, I hear a drummer and I go, wow, I like that, you know. So I listen to a lot of, lot of different drummers, even now. I mean, because you never stop learning. You know, uh, after 40 years, I'm, I still don't know everything. I'm constantly learning. I still look at all the drummers. And I still learn stuff, you know. So it's a, it's no limit. The sky is no limit because I think that's what I like about music. You would never attain that perfection you're trying to get. You just keep trying to be perfect because you would never reach that that cloud that's way up there. But you can keep getting close, you know. So I met, I mentioned NFL kickers. Same in sports with that trying to always. Elevate yeah. even higher. Trying to elevate, and you find that you surprise yourself on getting better. Things that you th think you couldn't do, all of a sudden now you could do because you kept trying. You kept trying. You kept trying. Now you can do it, and that's a part of your repertoire. So that's sort of the way drums is. But you got to be playing all the time because drums will beat you up. They will beat you down if you're not playing a lot. You know, you got to constantly be playing them. You can't be off the drums three weeks and do nothing. When you go back there, especially if you're doing concerts, when you go back to doing the concert, man, it will beat you up. You'll be hurting in places you didn't know you could hurt in, you know. But when you stay in shape and you play all the time, the drums are fun. Wow. You know, uh, for we have some common threads, I think, in that, um, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I know it very, very well. I only moved out to Charlotte area about 10 years ago. So I know all those La Brea, Crenshaw, everything, all that. I'm totally with you on all that. You know what I'm talking about. Exactly. Uh, that's where I grew up. Um, and then as far as Dallas goes, I'm a lifelong Cowboys fan. So I don't know if you can oh, see Okay. That. Okay. Right there, there's, uh, yeah. Yeah. I see you. I see you. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I used to go see the Cowboys. Uh, my dad used to take me to to the football games when it was the Dallas Cowboys 
and the Dallas Texans right before they left Dallas and went to Kansas City wow. and became the Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> That's like early Tom Landry days. Yeah, and they still kept the same colors, white and red. <laughs> yeah, and they they always wanted to be Dallas's team, but they Cowboys always beat them up. <laughs> so they just went on and left, you know. Getting back to the music. So once uh, you guys hit it with that record and, and you're doing the tours and all that, uh, what was your first TV appearance? Wow. I think our first TV was American Bandstand, Dick Clark. That was really amazing. I felt like we're in the big time, <laughs> you know? I mean, Dick Clark, I wouldn't have never thought in my wildest dreams I would ever meet Dick Clark. And he was the coolest guy. And he really loved music. He really did like all of the acts and stuff. He was really into it, you know? And I guess it's like some of the white guys back in the 50s that really loved black music. He was sort of the modern day guy like that, you Wolfman know? Wolfman Jack too. Wolfman Jack, yeah. Yeah, that was another one. I mean, and these guys had a knowledge they knew the music. They really had uh, a great sense of what was happening. And they kind of knew where it was going ahead of time, you know, because they were constantly having bands on there. I think one of the times we did it, it was us and Janet Jackson. And uh, wow, we've been with so many people. But yeah, we did American Bandstand three or four times. So you did American Bandstand before Soul Train? Was it before? I'm trying to think. Wow, you're making me go back. No, I think we did American Bandstand right up to Soul Train. Soul Train was the first one. I mean, to me, Don Cornelius was like, he was bigger than life. You know what I'm saying? He just kind of had that swag about him. And he was like, and see, as a matter of fact, Don Cornelius and Dick Griffey had the record company together. Mm -hmm. See, at first it was Don Cornelius and Dick Griffey that had the company. So Don Cornelius went on and stayed with Soul Train and took, you know, kept Soul Train and Lil Dick had a record company. That's how Soul Art became about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we did you're right, we did uh we did Soul Train first. And and that was really nice because the place wasn't as big as it looks on TV, you know. <laughs> But it was really a nice environment, and the dancers were really good. We, I, I can't even count the number of times we, we, we've done Soul Train. We was on Soul Train a lot, you know. How did you guys feel about lip syncing? We didn't like that part. Uh, we had to do it because that's the way Don them did it. But I always wanted to play live on Soul Train. We didn't get to play live on a show until uh, BET. We kind of we we actually started with BNT in 1980, but uh, that was the first TV program that we got a chance to play live on, and I really loved playing live on BT because they had they had the good equipment. You sounded good, and it's hard to sound good on TV, but we had a great en engineer. Uh, as a matter of fact, Leonard Jackson he did all of the stars. He did. Uh, all of that Rolls Royce stuff, uh, Wishing on a Star, that car wash album, he was over there. As a matter of fact, the way we were able to actually do, I mean, not to get away from the TV shows, but just as a little history real quick, our sound engineer always made us sound so good on TV. We were glad we had him. And I remember when we did something about that woman, he lit us sneak into Fort Knox at four o'clock in the morning. And and I cut the drums and Stevie cut the guitar part, part to something about that woman. And Stevie was like way on the other side of the studio. We couldn't see one another. We just could hear one another. And we actually cut the drums and the guitar to something about that woman at Fort Knox studio. Well, and, and hurry up and got out of it. Great in that track. 
Yeah, we had to get out of there by seven o'clock. So about six o'clock, we we were out of there and we were on the way back to rehearsal and we was listening to the drums and the guitar on the way back to rehearsal. And then we went in the studio at Solar and, and finished the rest of the record. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the way you guys interlocked the guitar strumming and your drum on that one, it's great. Well, it just was listening to one another and, and, and not being able to see one another, you had to re rely totally on the way it felt and listening to one another. And we just sit there and click so, so well together. And that was the fun about being in the studio. You didn't necessarily have to see the guy. All you had to do is just feel him and hear him good in headsets. And, and, and we did a lot of recordings where we were spread out in the studio and couldn't see one another. And I love that because we knew one another so well until we could play good like that. Can you imagine the same guys we've been playing together for over 40 years? It's like, I just know him, you know, I know what he's going to do, you know? Yeah. That's a, that's a special gift right there. Yeah, it is, man. It really is. So I want to talk about uh, the next record, Rough Riders, Fred. Um, I thought it was a really strong record and pull my string and from, um, from nine and total was on that one too. Yeah. yeah. I was, you know, that was like 79. I was full on in, I was in high school, big mm -hmm. on the house parties. Right. And those tracks were, you know, staples in the house parties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm surprised to see that pull my string was not a bigger hit. I would have thought, wow, that must've been top 10, top five. But, yeah, um, yeah. It didn't go quite as high. No, but you were, because you know, back then, uh, it was still, it was a lot of stuff happening in the music business in terms of radio and and uh, all of the politics and all this stuff. A lot of times, it necessarily had nothing to do with the record. It was so many good records that got lost because of the politics. You know, like the program with director would tell the DJ, "Well, if you play this record, you're fired." So these guys would lose their job if they played a record that they liked. And most of the, the records on, on, on our album, they would pull them. That wasn't even the single. Like Pull My String, it wasn't a single. Uh, Say Yes, it wasn't a single. You know, uh, Make My Day. All of these songs were just songs that the DJs liked. And the DJs that could, back then DJs could just about play what they wanted to play. And that's how those records got heard because they could play what they wanted to play. You try that now, man, a guy get fired. <laughs> if they well, don't play what's on their computer, they'll get fired. I would hear them all in three places. KDAY, 1580, KDA in LA. KDA, yeah. And also um, at House Parties DJ by the Shell of LA, who's a really big LA DJ and a good yeah. friend of mine. And then going to uh, record stores like VIP Records, yeah, Tower Records. Um, well, particularly the stores like over in the Crunch area, more of the black neighborhoods. Right, right, they, right. They would play them in store, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Because we used to do a lot of in stores. I mean, back then we would do in store on Crenshaw and the place would be packed like we're doing a concert. See you and get your autograph. Yeah. And we were always in the neighborhood. But when we came together as a band, it was a whole nother thing. It just magic. You know?